All right, so, um, I mean, we have to be honest. Web designers, web developers, very hard people to work with, right? We want to have controversial uh, working hours, uh, you know, some odd office policies. We listen to the music while we work. We don't answer our phone. We only answer emails twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. You know, we want to keep our productive time intact, right? And when you think about it, would you feel comfortable hiring such a service provider as yourself, right? For instance, a plumber who won't answer your phone, right? Not so much, right? So um, when, when talking to potential clients, we have to be aware of two things. First, they probably never uh, hired anyone before for that particular job, right? And the second thing is that they might be very afraid of, you know, just losing money or, or losing time hiring the wrong person. So when I'm talking about client experience design, that's basically um, the theory around the relationship between the client and the service provider. So it can be a designer, a web developer, whatever you call yourself. Uh, we can actually um, build better relationships with our clients and, you know, in the long run, help them um, embrace the user-centered thinking and help their organization to be more user-focused. That's the whole goal of, of uh, these kind of activities. And um, we should basically take our clients as our primary customers because they're paying the bill. That's the first thing. And uh, another thing is once you're done with the project, how they use it and how they maintain it and how they update the content, what they communicate to their end customers will be you know, based on, on their experience with you. So if they had good experience working with you, they will probably love their project even more. Right? They won't be just unhappy because um, the service provider, the designer or developer was some, someone who was very rude or someone who was very uh, unapproachable and just you know, uh, gave them a bad time. All right, so what's the difference between the client and the stakeholder? So in my mind, the client is the person who actually contacted you first. So it can be a marketing manager, it can be uh, a technical person who wants you to help them with implementation or, or whatever. But the stakeholders are all other people in the company on their side who have some legitimate interest in what you do. So don't be surprised, and you probably have that experience already, when someone shows up, you know, 90% of the project and wants to change things. These people are real, they always exist, and we call them stakeholders. Right, so what can we do to um, to improve the customer experience. First and foremost, we can demonstrate our value and also the value of the project, right? Then we can communicate better to, to make everyone understand what's, what's going on on the project. We can also facilitate collaboration. That's the tricky part. And finally, you know, we can become Zen masters and detach from, from all of our problems. And how do you demonstrate your value, right? The problem is that when you say to someone you, you just met, well, I'm really good, right? They didn't trust you, right? So the best way to, to, um, to present yourself to the, to the client is basically before you even meet them. So if somebody recommends you as a good service provider, that's probably it. You don't have to do anything on your end, right? You just have to confirm their assumptions. So uh, the next thing that you should do on the next project is basically be very pleasant to work with because this is what will follow you when your current client recommends you to their friend, to your potential next client, right? So absolutely do good work always, but also be very pleasant to work with. That's maybe more interesting than this one. All right. So another thing is to show and don't tell. So what do I mean by that? If you say we are the best agency in the world or I'm the best developer in the world or I'm really cool rock star, whatever, 
that's, that's telling, right? But instead of that, you can just show what you do. So uh, share your former client's successes. If you're building your portfolio, don't just make it look pretty. Uh, you can share some facts, like, you know, we accomplished this and that project in, I don't know, 30 days, if that's something important. Or you can say, we, you know, we increased the performance for the website, or we increased the, the number of uh, conversions on the website. So be very objective about it, you know, present the facts instead of you know, using adjectives, and people will have better time understanding you. The next thing is to basically introduce them with whatever they can comprehend at your first date, right? So you don't have to tell them your life story. You'll have plenty of time to talk about that, you know, once you get into, into the relationship. And, you know, uh, if, you, if you just spend all your cool stories on, on the first meeting when you're pitching them your services, then you won't have anything to talk about, you know, at the after work drinks or, or on other occasions. Very important thing, um, for instance, in 2009, when, when I founded my own studio, uh, a huge corporate client approaches us and they ask us to redesign the entertainment system UI. And it was built on Java and it had really poor capabilities. Uh, it was, I don't know, something like, like 300 megahertz processor. And we were pretty scared about, you know, uh, saying yes to that project. But the cool thing was that we, you know, we eventually went to a meeting and it turned out that they just needed some kind of proof of concept. So it didn't matter actually if it was built in, uh, in Java or JavaScript or in HTML, CSS, whatever, as long as we could kind of mock it up and put it on the screen so that they can actually demonstrate their, you know, uh, their, their ideas, their plans with the, with the interface. Um, the cool consequence of that is that this particular client actually gave us all the challenging you know, projects over the course of you know, these uh, seven years, and we still work with them uh, to this day. The last thing about the about the, uh, demonstrating your value is whenever you have a really huge project, you can start it by basically solving one small part. So for instance, when a client came to us and said, well, we need 60 local website uh, redesigns, and we need it in 60 days, we were like, oh, w wait a minute. That's a lot, right? So they all have the same design, but you have to take into consideration like Arabic, right to left. You have to take into consideration German language, which has this sausage long words, right? I mean, that's something in Croatian, sausage long. Doesn't, doesn't exist in English, anyway. Um, and the thing is that uh, for, for that particular project, we just said, well, let's solve the one, one small problem, which was the main navigation for this huge number of websites, right? And then we, when we ran a, a week-long workshop and spent another week to kind of, you know, code it, they, they were sure that we were the right provider for them. And again, it was a small risk because uh, they didn't have to ask senior management to, you know, to approve the budget. They didn't have to commit to anyone in the company. They could have test us for two weeks and then decide if they want to work with us, right? So. Whenever you see that the client is not so sure about working with you, but you think you can help them, suggest something really small, demonstrate your value on a small scale, and then you know, talk about the, the bigger engagement. All right, so how to develop shared on the string? The first thing is you should audit everything. So whenever somebody approaches you with a, with a redesign request, just learn everything about the project, right? Go uh, and, and, and pull out all the data, evaluate the content, um, evaluate the information architecture, create tons of tons of spreadsheets, and put the comments in, and then share with the client to just demonstrate that you started thinking about the project, right? And while you're creating these uh, spreadsheets, because spreadsheets are the best design tools, by the way, um, you just kind of evaluate the scope of the project, right? So for instance, you can just list all the elements that need to be redesigned, like the hero image, 
you know, uh, news boxes, news lists, search engine uh, results, forms, sidebar. You just list things, and while you're doing it, while you're trying to understand what's the scope of the project, you're actually scoping the project. And then once you have a really comprehensive set of spreadsheets, you can easily attach some main days or main hours to them and already have some you know, pretty, pretty good picture about what it takes to redesign that project. Again, you're doing this before actually engaging in the project. And the next thing you can do, you can conduct uh, quick usability testing. Our favorite tool is a free trial, peak.usertesting.com. You go there, paste the link, and you get free videos by the end of the day, five minute long videos with random users explaining if they understand the website. You can do that for your client website and for their competition. So the, the, uh, the moment you start talking about the competition, you'll already have some insight about what's working and what's not working. Of course, um, you should talk to all stakeholders, the guys from the beginning. So try to uh, see if they have competing goals with this project. So someone might want to push their, um, their, their agenda, basically, right? So they want to optimize performance, but the other team maybe wants to create more uh, appealing graphics. And these are competing goals, right? Because if you add more images, more video, more multimedia, make everything uh, super visually rich, uh, then you basically you know, often break performance. Another important thing is to define the project goals. Again, after you talk to stakeholders, see the, you know, meet with the, with the, with the topmost stakeholder, the boss of all bosses, and see if you can kind of filter out what is the real goal. So, you know, sometimes performance won't matter. That's sad, but true. Sometimes the appeal won't matter. Sad, but true. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have a, a clear goal. And the, 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 the question that we like to ask is, uh, how can you define success for this project, right? And then if they say this project will be successful if it's on time, then that's your goal. Just you know, do it on time. Doesn't matter if you want to be more creative, if you want to improve performance, if the goal is to launch it on the particular date, then that's your focus. You should focus on that, right? Don't invent things, don't be creative, don't be like, let's try something new on this project. Uh, another thing that we started using two years ago uh, and putting basically in the contract is policies. And policies are different than guidelines because guidelines are just suggestions how things should work, right? But when you put project policies, for instance, we want to be faster than the fastest competition, that's a performance policy. We want to be accessible level AA, for instance, if you work for Canadian clients. Uh, we want to, we want to, the user to understand everything what's on the page, that's the information density policy. You can basically uh, limit the problem space and make them better focus when they have to make decisions, right? Because if you put something in the contract and you commit to, to it and they commit to it, um, you, you actually are establishing some limitations. So we cannot just go, you know, to eternity and beyond because this is the square within we can play, right? All right, so the, the last thing is pretty straightforward and pretty common sense, but what we like to do is, because that's the nature of our work, we want to say when we are not available, but also say when we are 100% available and when we are like 50% available. And when you say to someone, I'll be 100% available, you better be 100% available, right? So no way that we can put anything else beside that client project on that week. In our case, we, we, we scope everything by weeks, not the days, right? So when you're available 100% uh, when you promised, they will respect your time off. So we don't have a problem of just, you know, uh, leaving the office for two weeks because we have vacation, you know, we never had that kind of problem with the client. We don't have to have uh, non-overlapping uh, shifts or whatever, because when you're available, as you promised, they don't have a problem of letting you go you know, when you're not available. All right, so the hard part.
Cool, right? All right, so facilitated collaboration. All right, so I have to be honest. I won't talk about the, the best way to, to solve any problem. And it's a design sprint. Any one of you heard about the design sprint? And just quite a few people, all right? Cool? Yeah. I mean, you can, you can raise your hand. I just explained to her a minute ago. Uh, so it's a five days uh, based process of, of uh, time constrained exercises with the stakeholders. And uh, at the end of the week, you get to user test your concept and you uh, come to a solution, right? And then if you're not happy with the solution, you repeat the process again next week, et cetera, et cetera. That's currently the best way you can solve a design problem that I know of, right? But <coughs> some teams cannot conduct design sprints, but you know, they still have to work together. So what can we do? Right? By the way, Don Norman is the guy who invented user experience as a term. Right? So he coined it. This is the guy who worked for Apple in, in late 80s and early 90s, and now partners with Jakob Nielsen, usability.org. Right? Really smart guy. And uh, basically, what I'm telling you today is all from 90s. You just have to dig out the right books, all right? So Don Norman is a really great hour. All right, so what can you do? You can include everyone again, but not in a way to uh, ask for their opinions, but to make them collaborate with their peers. So again, from my personal experience, I was one, um, well, I was one once coming to a meeting, and I wasn't late, but everyone else were already there, so that's not being late, right? Uh, there was a long conference table, and then one team from building department was, was on the left, and another one from, from the self-care was on the right. And they, you know, nobody spoke a word. It was really quiet in the room. And I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, all right. Now I understand what's the problem. Because they, they were competing departments. So getting them into the same room and starting a dialogue was all, everything that, you know, the only thing that I needed to do. I didn't have to design anything. I just needed to mediate the negotiations, you know, between the two opposing uh, departments. Another thing that you can do to facilitate collaboration is to basically use the tools that they use. So be flexible. Don't be, you know, don't be uh, too rigid. Don't say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just working on whatever Thursdays, and this is the only this is the only day when I can have meetings, and the rest is just productive time or whatever. You know, be flexible. So. Always try to use their tools. If they use Microsoft Office and you're like, oh, really? Just use Office, right? If they, if they prefer Basecamp to Trello, use Basecamp, even though Trello is your favorite tool for project management, right? If they use Excel spreadsheets, use them instead of whatever else. So if you're flexible, if you meet them where they are, then you can have a better chance of actually doing some work together. And the third thing is, to use low-tech tools, um, and by that I mean just regular to-do lists, right? Meeting, uh, meeting minutes, so after each meeting, you write a short list of things that were discussed, send it, and ask this question. This is very crucial. Is this what we agreed upon, right? And immediately, if there's an error, if somebody had a different understanding, they will reply and say, no, no, no we discussed something else. We decided something else. But if you don't send the meeting minutes, if you don't have this report of a meeting that they have to confirm, then everybody will just have their version of the meeting. And you know how it happens. It's, not, it's just human nature. Nobody does it on purpose. For instance, me and my brother, when we talk about our you know, uh, uh, days when we were kids, some, some adventures that we have were like a total nightmare for him and you know, really great for me. And you know, the other way around, some, some horrible events from our childhood, horrible, right? Um, were completely normal to him, but you know, I just kind of remember them as being not so pleasant, right? Because our memory is actually not that good. All right, ready for, for this guy? Why don't we have sound here? Because this is my only slide with sound. Can we, can we try it again? All right. But but I'm the best. Huh? A little louder? But but I'm the best. 
All right, so what's the biggest problem when working with people? Your ego, of course. So how to, how to attain this you know, Zen monk detachment from your projects, right? All right, so one important thing is don't have personal preferences. And by personal preferences, I mean even if something's ugly or, or, or nice, don't have that preference, right? Don't have this kind of judgment. Don't have a preference around color. Don't have a preference about... I mean, I'm not saying that. This is not taped, right? Can you please turn it on? JavaScript framework, right? <laughs> Because whenever you have a preference, you're just getting into the conflict. And we as professionals, maybe not in the beginning when you're starting out your career, but you know, after five years, six years, seven years, you don't have to prove anyone you know, that you know your stuff. But what you can do, you can understand and anticipate what can go wrong and just be something, you know, a single objective person in a room when stakeholders get into the fight over the, you know, uh, who wants the, uh, the, the, the topmost position on the homepage or, you know, whose uh, call to action is the most important, you have to be the sober one. And because you have experience, you don't have to have your preference, right? You don't have to create. Let them create because everyone has ideas, right? All the clients already know before they hire you what they want to have on the website, how it should look like. What, what are the functionalities? They like this experience for apple.com. You just let them have it. Yeah, just let's, let's do the apple.com. Let's do the Adidas. Let's do the Nike. Let's do whatever you want, right? But you can be the, the, the person who can understand the, the, the thing from the beginning, and this is uh, the structure of the website, the content that you have, and the, the, the goal that you're trying to solve, right? Because you understood everything in the beginning, because you did your homework, you talked to everyone, and you know what, what are the problems that, that bothers everyone, you know, or each person in the project, you can be the one who can just you know, control the escalation, right? And another thing that's really difficult, uh, especially if you still have your preference, is making others look good, right? So if you're a UX designer. It's not your job to be the superhero on the project, right? It's your job to think about the user. And the best way to help the user is to try to at least slightly change the corporation or change the company or change your client so that they think about the users in a more positive way, in a, more, in a way that we think about the users, right? By being right all the time, by, by being the smart, smartest person in the room, you're actually just creating animosity. And they'll just say, yeah, this, this guy's like douchebag, right? We don't want to do that, right? But if they succeed, if you have a contact person in a huge organization, and they can pull off a project that can both serve user needs and also earn money for the company, then they have a badge of success for that project. And then the next time, they want to work on another project, or their colleague want to work on a project, they will just ask, how did you do that? And they will say, user-centered design, All right? So this is your role as a UX designer, as a senior developer, as the, as the system architect, whatever. The moment you become a senior person, that's the moment when you don't have any more desire to be the best in the room, right? Can you rest, right? Finally, when you put all that effort into the project, it's really out of our control how it's going to be used, right? If you're an in-house person, you will just send it to a department. They will put crap content into it. They will, they will ignore some you know, important parts. They will not update the, the map. If you're, if you're working for a client as a service provider, they will just they will just hire someone who is like who cannot code the database or you know whatever all the cool features that you thought about for 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 weeks months years even can be just you know go down the drain but it really doesn't make sense to um, to be bitter about it and to burn the bridges right 
because that's just natural. We don't have a control over it. So just, you know, let it go. All right? So demonstrate the value. Don't talk about yourself. Just do the good job, right? And be pleasant to work with. People will recommend you. I mean, in our case, we literally had one client, and that was this year, that wasn't recommended. Somebody who landed to the website and sent an email, and we actually signed the contract. So, so since 2009, we only had clients that were recommended, right? So from my personal experience, it really doesn't matter if you, if you go to conferences like this, right? If you write articles, if you write books even, books are like total waste of time, if you think about the time, right? About the return of investment, right? Because it takes you a couple of months to do it. You know, the, the honorarium is not that big. Maybe people won't like it. I mean, that's more the case than not, right? But being a good person to work with is actually the best marketing, all right? Share the understanding. Do your homework. Never have an approach, this is not my job. This is your job to learn everything about the client, right? So sometimes you'll have to read all the boring financial reports to actually understand why, why, why they are redesigning this website. Maybe they just hope that they will increase the shareholder value, right? Maybe the dividends will go up if they redesign. Maybe just, they're just doing that to kind of create an image of a successful company, even though they're probably going bankrupt in, in a couple of months, right? So do your homework, and then you'll understand better what you have to solve. Collaborate. Try to you know, make them talk together. Try to see what the other side thinks. Try to kind of merge everything and create the compromise over the problems that you have, right? And finally, I mean, just let it go, because uh, you have so much work to do. It doesn't, doesn't really uh, make sense to to stick to it and to kind of grab, you know, and cling onto the project and say, this is my project, I'm the boss here, right? Because you're not. We all do this as a problem-solving thing. We want to earn money. We're not here for art, because if you're here for art, just do websites for free, all right? All right, so that was hard. Still with me? Mm. All right, almost done. All right, so again, as, we'll, as web designers, as web developers, we are really user-centric because we are the users of the internet. We love the internet. Everyone in this room loves the internet. We breathe it, right? It's our meat, it's, it's water. It's a, it's a shitty McDonald's burger, right? You just take it because you, you, you work like late hours and this is the only thing that's open, right? So why can't we just help the client to become like us? Why can't we help them to understand what the internet is and what is the user need and try to equip them with some tools, with some techniques, with some different thinking to create a change in their own company? Thank you.